I think we're just going to kick it off. Uh, for those of you who don't know that are here, uh, this is Dr. G, Gabrielle Lyon, and then Don Saladino. They are two of our experts. Um, my name is Elisa, and I am our community manager here. And I have one of our other marketing managers, Emily. She's going to be um, here as well. She'll be answering like any of the chronometer questions that come up and directing people. There she is. Hey, Em. Hi, Emily. Okay, so I'm just going to start. If anyone has any um, questions, any of the participants, please fire them away. This is basically, we're doing this for you. Uh, but I did get a bunch when I made an Instagram post. Um, and I'm just going to start. I'm just going to get right in there. So here we go. I was once prescribed a high dose vitamin B complex that after a couple weeks made me aggressive and angry. I don't know which of the B vitamins I reacted to. Is there some general guidance on which ones are likely to do that for people like me? Not now that I track micros, it could really make a difference. Mm. Uh, this, this individual didn't specify um, or elaborate on what people like me uh, meant, but love to hear your thoughts if there's some uh, vitamins that are associated with mental health. So, well, number one, I think that that's really interesting. She or he, yes. she is talking about um, feeling aggressive when taking B vitamins. And, I, you know, I have not actually seen that so much in clinic, but I will tell you that there's some individuals, uh, there's a mutation in a gene called MTHFR, and it makes the utilization of certain B vitamins more challenging. And those individuals actually need a very specific form of B vitamin, and you can, you know, be tested for that. And one way an individual would look is to look at your homocysteine level. So it would be in a basic blood draw, any physician can uh, draw it. And if you have an elevated homocysteine level, you could be an individual who may not be metabolizing B vitamins in the same way an individual without this gene wouldn't. That, so you, this is something you can get tested for. Are there, are there certain nutrients that if you're deficient in that could cause some <laughs> some behavioral stuff is, or is that? Well, I think, I think that's an interesting question. Um, vitamins and minerals, definitely B vitamins, definitely iron things of that nature are really important for cognitive development. Also omega-3 fatty acids also really important for cognitive development. Do we know that there are certain nutrients related to say aggression or behavior? Uh, I would say that that would be a stretch in that way, but really optimizing for making sure your iron is good, making sure that you do have adequate B vitamins, B6, there, you know, uh, B12, folate are all, it's it, the way in which the system works is kind of like an orchestra. So it's very much a synergy. Is, I don't know if Don has something to add. Yeah, I, I mean, oh God, I, I mean, there, there's so many people who will reach out to me weekly with, I think this did that, right? And this isn't to devalue the question. And it, I think it's very fascinating because I've never heard of, of B vitamins causing any type of aggression. But, um, you know, I have heard people affiliating or, or thinking that the affiliation of one supplement is giving them a, a response that something completely different could have, right? Like, I, I, I've, I've had people go away and be like, oh, I'm taking l glutamine and I, you know, and I just feel great. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're sleeping an extra 90 minutes tonight, like something very right. basic or, yeah, or, yeah. or, or, or like, I, you know, I've, I've gotten really aggressive lately and I think it's from these amino acids and I'm like, yeah, do, what else did you do? And they start, well, I'm like, how much coffee are you drinking? Well, I, you know, I've really increased that a lot. You know, I've gone from like hundred million grams a day to 300 milligrams a day. I'm like, well, it's probably that. So it's very, and that's why it's very difficult in a short period of time to be able to pinpoint you know, it's that one thing. I mean, sometimes it can be very obvious, but other times I, I think it, this is why I really believe in journaling and really looking at, you know, your days and your, you know, not only journaling what you're consuming, but journaling, you know, thoughts or activities or, you know, stresses, you know, how did today end up, you know, just something very basic and simple. And if you go back in there, maybe with the very simple number rating, like, you know, zero was absolutely awful. One was eh, two was okay, three was really good. And you start going in and out of nowhere, you have zeros and ones over the last week, could be stressing yourself out, could be, you know, and as this stress adds up, this can obviously, as Dr. Gabrielle knows, this yeah. can lead to this, you know, um, decrease in mood, this decrease in, in, in behavior. It's not just, oh, well, 
you know, I've, I've been stressed out for the last two weeks. I'm like, well, by being stressed out the last two weeks, that stress can snowball. It can get worse and worse. So sometimes I really think that, you know, journaling and, and, and truly, you know, stepping out and, and assessing what's going on day in and day out could be really useful because sometimes we think it's one thing. It could be something else. And again, I'm not saying that to devalue the B, the B vitamin comment. I'm just telling people to think maybe a little bit differently. So just to chime in as uh, someone who uses Chronometer, not only someone who works here, but we actually have a charting library and people can actually like hit different variables against each other. And like to what you're saying, Don, you can go in there and you can track your mood against like something like sleep or, you know, your calorie intake. And I think that that's obviously like getting into the nitty gritty, but if people are really wanting to dial in their health, it's, it's an awesome functionality that I've used. Like I eat way more when I sleep less. <laughs> so right. and, and actually out. shift workers do as well too. So individuals that actually work overnight shifts, they tend to actually eat more. And, and I, that I, a lot. I, yeah. I wouldn't have known that if I actually didn't use uh, our app. So Let's move on to Fabiana's question. Hi, after exercise, what should we eat and how long should we wait before eating? Because of the transitory permeability after workout. Yeah, you know, and I think that Don and I have similar views on this and I'm going to speak to it from an aging perspective. And then Don, I think would be phenomenal if he talks about it from a, a performance perspective in the literature, there's this huge dichotomy between, you know, is there this anabolic window? How close after training should I eat? And I will say that if you're an individual who is older, and when I say older, you know, 40 or above, which isn't old, but, you know, 40, 50, 60, <laughs> 40, you, 40, 50, 60 um, you know, and maybe 40 is a little on the younger end. There is this, this change that happens in skeletal muscle called anabolic resistance. What that means is muscle is actually a nutrient sensing organ and the ability for it to sense nutrients becomes less efficient. Therefore, if an individual is just done training, there is an increase in blood flow. And this is a prime time to actually take in dietary protein. It can overcome this anabolic resistant response. And if you are an you know, more mature individual, this would be very beneficial. And, you know, for anyone who has older parents or, you know, my dad's 70, I, I have him eat protein after. And I think that there is a lot of merit to that. You specifically asked how soon after, and I would say, why wait? I mean, it doesn't have to be, you finish your training and then you're going to have protein immediately. But I think that the sooner you have it after the better, and I'll just throw into the carbohydrate aspect, is protein I think of for muscle recovery and carbohydrate I think of for glycogen repletion. And then I'll kick it off to Don. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree. I mean, obviously um, we, we have the same viewpoints on this. I, I look at it more of like a broad spectrum. Like, so if someone's gonna turn around one day and they're gonna have, you know, they're gonna miss their post-workout nutrition. And let's say at 40 minutes, they're gonna get their meal down. Like is, is there, you know, is, um, you know, is, is muscle development going to be, be hindered? The answer is no. It's like one day, it's not right. a big deal. I'm more interested in, you know, over, over time, I'd really like to maintain blood sugar levels. So I feel like that, as Dr. G says, when you're done with your workout and that furnace is burning, you know, that is a great time for us to get those nutrients. Like it's a dry sponge, like that sponge is going to absorb all those nutrients. And I, and I really feel like at that point, we can really set ourselves up for some success for the rest of the day. Now, you know, my, my thought process is I'm really trying to get it within the 30 minute window, just because if I don't, I feel like that, you know, things can start being thrown off with, you know, how I'm feeling and energy levels, et cetera, for the rest of the day. But yeah, the sooner for me, the better. If I'm finishing a workout, I'm able to get a meal down five, 10 minutes after I am just because I, I'm probably a little bit glycogen depleted, right? And my, my body, why not? Like, I don't think there's any downside. I don't really understand the point in waiting. And then, um, you know, and then as we wait, think about this, everyone, like we have, we have this window of opportunity where we, this, you know, this specific times during the day where you have the ability to take in those nutrients. And, you know, and that's why I kind of struggle with fasting for most people, because if you are doing the 16, eight, and I think there's a lot of merit to intermittent fasting, but now you have this eight hour window where you have to get all this nutrition in, right. And a lot of people aren't disciplined enough to really get all this nutrition and like a lot of people are really just bouncing back from a poor night of eating or they might have lunch and then they're having like a shake or a bar and then they're having dinner and it's like all right like 
is that enough? Are you getting enough macro and micronutrients to allow your body to repair and be really powerful? And if the answer is yes, then okay, then try for a while. But um, if you're unable to get those nutrients in, you know, you need like those, those hours that I'm awake, that's an opportunity for me to just kind of collectively build equity with the nutrition that I'm, that I'm taking in. That's such a good way of looking at it. I really like that. As someone who fasts sometimes, that's, that's definitely a good perspective. And, and I do too, right? I think fasting has its place. And, um, you know, like John said, there is a component of actually being careful about if you're fasting, are you then moving to a chronic underfeeding where right. your metabolism slows down and your body becomes accustomed to a much lower calorie intake, which over a period of time does and can cause metabolic damage. I know Don sees this all the time where individuals have really yo-yo dieted or used fasting to really decrease their caloric intake. And maybe they're kind of, uh, you know, plugging away at 800 calories a day. Yeah. And Dr. G is pretty, pretty smart with it, right? Like she's going to, if she's going to use this as, as a tool, she's going to make sure she's getting the nutrition that she needs at the end of the day for the rest of the day. A lot of people I've seen use it in time. Like they may get, Oh, I feel great. I feel amazing. And in months down the road, I'm starting to see numbers drop or, you know, specific, um, you know, intervals that they're, that they're running or their recovery starts dropping a little bit and they're, they're feeling them, their, their self themselves weaken a bit. Right. So, you know, I think these are great tools to use. I just think you got to be pretty thoughtful with it. That is really good points. Uh, Roger has a question for us in your previous webinar. I love that you listened to our previous webinar, Roger. You discussed you. getting people back to TDEE. I used chronometer for years, thanks for that too, and have maintained a caloric deficit most of the time. I'd like to know if I should eat to my TDEE, not crediting exercise and calories burned. What is your advice? Well, like Don, kick this one off. You sure? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, um, we can, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Listen, I'm a, I'm a believer that, you know, if you've been in a deficit for a period of time and you're feeling like things are really becoming stale, like this is what we were talking about with the IF, um, what's the downside in slowly, slowly <laughs> bringing up your macros? Like what's the downside? And, 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 and listen, I, I, I see this all the, all the time. Someone's like, oh, you know, I'm consuming 1200 calories. And chronometer is telling me 2,200. Like, that's going to be a lot of food for me to get tomorrow. And I'm like, no, don't do it. Like, like don't do that that much tomorrow. Like, but like the slower, the better. Like, if we could take maybe 100 to, you know, I think the rate, 100 to 200 calories a week. And just, we just bumped it. 100 calories a week, guys. That's 25 grams of protein. That's mm -hmm. 25 grams of carbs. Yeah. You know, that could be 11 grams of fat is 99 calories. I mean, when yeah. you start doing the math like this, you're like, oh, that's not a big deal. So if someone had to jump up, 200 calories that could be a 25 gram protein and a 25 gram of carbohydrate meal snack call it what you what, what you want and if you wanted to take it even a little bit further and you're eating five times a day we can distribute that out for about five grams a meal in each category i mean this is really dissecting it now but when a lot of people get overwhelmed by these numbers if you start doing the math and you start just looking at it from a broad spectrum view you can dish this out over, over time. Now, I think if someone's in a deficit and they're asking these questions, because listen, deficits can be great and they do work. And I've used them and I've had people, you know, get into them for short periods of time. But if you're starting to feel like energy levels are depleting a bit, all right, I've kind of like overstayed my welcome. Like I'm, okay. I'm, I just can't drop any more fat. I can't change my body composition. Then maybe that's a time to kind of reverse diet a little bit. This is a, a term that Dr. G and I have used for years where we just slowly start bringing those calories up. And what's what can happen, right? Like you could gain a pound or two. Like that's, that's very common. But you, I've seen people who haven't gained weight. And I've had, I've had people who've actually changed body composition <laughs> when raising calories slowly. And that's, they're almost a little confused. They're like, well, how's this? How's this possible? And I'm like, well, you just technically haven't been giving your body the nutrients, the fuel that it needs to run optimally. Right now, we're trying to get in there and supercharge the engine. And we're right. trying to get more horsepower out of it so it can run not only more efficiently, but just, you know, it could just, you know, run better, right? So that's kind of how I like to refer to hitting that TDE number. And I feel like you've got to spend some time there 
especially for someone who might be in such a deficit, like say you're at 800 to 1,000 calories a day and chronometers telling you that your TDE needs to be 2,200 calories, um, you know, it's going to take some time to get up there. And then I think like, there's nothing wrong with staying up there for a little bit, right? It's just, totally. it's, it's, it's work guys. It's work, right? It's going to take time. It's going to take a little bit of math, but if you got to bump it a thousand calories and you say a thousand calories is 200 calories a week, and I'm going to raise it 200 calories a week for five weeks. That's a thousand calories. And that could be, and you start breaking down how you want to raise those macros to meet those percentage uh, goals that chronometer is giving you. It becomes very easy. It becomes fun. And you start noticing a lot of things improve out of your energy level, maybe body composition, sleep and recovery, right? Dr. Hey. G, like you yes. see these bodybuilders get into a deficit. They are, they're waking up at night. It can become yes. very dangerous. Yeah. Sorry. It's my nanny. Sorry for the rant. Sorry for the rant. No, it's good. No, that's, no. So it's, it, that's great. I, I've been a product of all the goodness that you're talking about. Dr. G, actually, if anyone has any more questions about uh, reverse dieting, because it is a very unique concept for sure. We're hearing more of it. Dr. G did an awesome uh, video that's available on our Instagram. You can go check it out. Uh, it was great. Um, there was a couple questions that I can answer real quick. There was a question that says some of the food like medjool dates versus dates only when you make a search does not display the correct nutrients like magnesium or potassium. And why is that? So that just comes down to our data sources. If you're using a branded product like Rice Krispies, for example, it's going to have less nutrition information than a generic entry from the NCCDB database. Uh, those are lab analyzed. With the branded products, we'll only include what's on the nutrition label. So there is that. Uh, I have a blog on that. Um, that, that person was anonymous, but if you wanted to ask Emily for a resource in our chat, she would be happy to link to a blog on that exactly. Uh, Greg says, I keep showing a deficiency in choline. Are there products you recommend? The internet yeah. search is difficult to sort through the extreme number of products. Yeah, I think choline, one of the best sources for choline is eggs. Mm -hmm. great source. And it's actually great for pregnant moms as well. Uh, eggs is a great source of choline. Yes. That Probably my top go-to source. There is that information in crop. Um, what do total and net carbs mean to a keto diet? Okay. Now I might have an unpopular opinion on this. I don't actually look at net carbs. I just assume carbs are carbs. I think it's a really safe way to do it. Sometimes when people look at net carbs, it's really a, a subtraction of fiber. Again, a ketogenic diet is an extremely low carbohydrate diet. I, it's like, what is it? 5% or less, it's 70% fat, 20%, um, right? Correct me, Don, if I'm wrong, 20% protein and maybe 10% yeah, it's, it's, carbs. Yeah, I thought it was, it might be even, I thought it was less protein, but it's, yeah, it's very, it's very yeah. little protein. That's what, yeah, I, I think you're about right there. Um, yeah. So again, your carbohydrate intake, and if you follow the uh, traditional Atkins stuff, it's 20 grams uh, or less. So he was, you know, kind of the first person to move people into a ketogenic diet for the, the general population. And, you know, you're looking at maybe 20 grams of carbohydrates or less. So when you are thinking about that, you really are thinking about greens. That's where the majority of your carbohydrates are going to come from. And again, a lot of people use net carbs. I tend not to because there is some absorption from the carbohydrates, uh, depending on the fiber type, maybe not a ton, but some, so that, that would be my answer for that. And, and let me, let me add something to that. This is why I, I agree with Dr. Gabrielle here uh, for, uh, for another reason. I feel like net carbs and, and I have some clients measure and not measure, and it depends. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reasons why, but, um, I feel like carbo, I, I feel like uh, vegetables are one of the most valuable things that we can add into our nutrition, getting co different colors, a variety. I mean, um, Dr. G um, and I shot a video the other day on cruciferous vegetables and she was giving me this whole education on, no, seriously. On, no, like, it was on, fun. On, no, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun, but sometimes what ends up happening is when people are trying, you see this in bodybuilders, when they're trying to hit their number, they start devaluing vegetables, right? Like they're like, oh, well, this doesn't work towards my total number and it's just going to fill me up and I don't need it. And I'm just like, wow, there's so much value and there's so much benefit that you're not receiving 
from eliminating those vegetables. So with a lot of people, I like counting it because again, this, yeah. this becomes a way to gamify our nutrition, right? Like we're turning around and every meal that we put in a chronometer, for me, it becomes fun. It's like, oh, wow. Okay. Like hit my number, hit my number, hit my number. You're like okay. gamifying this. And I don't want to take, I don't want to stop playing the game with one of the most important, um, I mean, it things is. that bring in micronutrients to the body and fiber. I mean, obviously you're not going to categorize yeah. that as a macronutrient. Like it's not like a, it's not a starchy right. car, but it still is a macronutrient right. at the end of carbohydrate. Yeah. And I, I think people always have questions about fibers. Really, when we think about fiber, there's, well, number one, why is fiber important? We know that it helps with heart disease. Um, you know, there's some things that would indicate it helps with diabetes and, you know, regulating blood sugar, constipation, colon cancer two main types of fiber, soluble, insoluble, right? Those insoluble fibers are things when you think about the cell wall, it's like that woody kind of a situation. And then soluble fibers, the, the best example I can give you is like um, oats. When you put oats and they swell up, that's more of a, a soluble fiber. And I will say that the if you are gonna look at your app, if you're gonna look at chronometer, the goal would be the recommendation is 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. I am um, actually, can I just show Eric Greer asked, a, asked a, a great question about 40, 40, 20 or 35, 35, 35. I typically start people around 35, 35, 35, mm -hmm. right? Meaning 35% protein, 35% carbs and 30% fat. But mm -hmm. I want them to log their food in chronometer for several days to see some sort of a pattern. And if they're so yeah. below those numbers, or so over those numbers, like we're gonna have to adjust accordingly. So I think, yeah, I think the goal is to, to start around that, but we're always deviating from that number. That's what a good coach does. I mean, but I think that's a good place to, to start. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of a really great questions. I wanna answer this one. So this is, I think really important because there's a lot of kind of confusion out there. This is having heard that dairy isn't ideal for postmenopausal women. What are your suggestions regarding calcium for bone density? I think that calcium is actually very important for postmenopausal women. The idea that dairy is not necessarily good for postmenopausal women, I, I don't agree with that. Um, but if you are having some kind of reaction to dairy, then a calcium supplement, a calcium vitamin D K2 supplement is what is recommended. Um, that's awesome. Albert, that you guys are going through the questions as well. So we, Albert, Albert Mraz asked a good question about tips for gaining weight. Albert, really, really quickly, I, I, again, I think it's math. Like once we start understanding what the TDEE guys, I saw a couple of questions come in, stands for total daily energy expenditure. So like you have your resting energy expenditure, which is like, if you were to sit down on a couch all day, how many calories are you burning? And then you have your non-resting energy expenditure, which is like if you go run or walk or like brush your teeth, like that's activity. And those, uh, you know, and the TDE is kind of the, uh, it's, a it's a formula where you combine those, those uh, two. But I think for gaining weight, it's simple math. If we can now, and, and these are numbers, so I'm not gonna tell you that 10 out of 10 times they're spot on, like, but chronometer does a phenomenal job in getting you right to that area where now you can go north or south. And I think if you're struggling to get weight, try and hit your TDEE for a week to two weeks, like get to that number, see how your body feels. Are your pants fitting a little tight? Are you, are you, maybe that's when you want to weigh in and maybe you want to see, all right, like I was 180 pounds on, on day one and on day 14, I'm 180 pounds. And I think that's when we could start using these indicators, whether, well, do we need to take them up? Right. And if you're hitting that TDE for a period of time, and you're not gaining any weight, and you're not really losing any weight, or you are losing weight, then we need to then we need to start increasing those macronutrients. And at that point, it's making a determination: are we are we increasing protein, carbs, or fat? Now, Dr. G and I agree that the first macronutrient, like the most important one, to us, it, it's it's protein. Like we want to make sure we're hitting that protein number. And at that point, whether you want to go higher carbs totally. or higher fats, this is yeah, this is where it becomes a little bit of a um, this educated, not a guessing game, this educated you know, a uh, guessing game where we have to now start moving those numbers, but you got to keep those numbers in a specific place for a period of time. This is one of the biggest problems I see with weight gain or weight loss, right? Dr. G it's like someone will totally. hit their numbers for three days, a few days, and then they'll come off of it. And you're like, all right, you're not allowing the body to make any change. Like you're, 
your macros one day were at 3,500 and the next day, the next two days they're at 2,500. Like you're all over the place. Yeah. Like yeah. we have to start, we, we got to start building that foundation. So two weeks, hit your TDE, see what happens. And then you could start moving those macros north, do it slowly, take your time. And if you're going to put some size on it, you want to put some muscle on, be patient with that stuff. You don't want to do it quickly. Yeah. No. Like that can take a long time. <laughs> building building your kind of muscle don takes years. Yo, yeah. He's a like he's a freak. <laughs> he's a freak. Uh, uh, okay. Mario has a couple of questions about magnesium and potassium. I will lump them into one. Does peeing deplete magnesium and potassium? How much magnesium and potassium and sodium? Those are the electrolytes. Do I need to maintain for active persons working out? 30 minutes to one hour a day. And then also asked in that same vein, does coffee deplete magnesium and potassium as well? This is a, this is a tough question. So I will tell you, um, the everyone's sweat is different by the way. So the amount that an individual is going to sweat, whether, you know, what the ever, the amount of sodium that comes out of an individual is actually totally different. Um, I don't know the baseline recommendation, but I will tell you, for, for example, my patients, if an individual is highly active and sweating a lot, adding in a, an electrolyte, like we use element in our practice all the time for individuals, and that has sodium, potassium, um, yeah, I think, you know, maybe a, a few other things I think is a, a great way to go. I don't know the amounts in terms of how much you urinate out. We'd have to check into that in terms of a lab value. But I guess the question I think that you're asking is how do you maintain hydration in a way that doesn't affect your performance? Um, and the way in which I would do that is if you feel the need is, um, yeah, I would just add in an easy shake, like an easy scoop or even a little bit of uh, sea salt. Yes. I mean, that's been a game. That's been a game changer for me over the last, you know, five, six years. Cause you know, we're, we're always, when you, when you're getting ready for a, a cover shoot, you know, you're always told to start depleting water and doing all this garbage that I, I wish yeah. I didn't do back then. It's just such a waste of time. Right. But, um, I think salt was something, even when I was prepping for my, for my October cover of muscle and fitness, mm -hmm. I would literally use a pinch of pink salt on every meal and I would yeah. put it on to, to taste it just for my activity level. It allowed me to keep more muscle fullness. It allowed me you know, I mean, you know, I wasn't waking up as much at night to use the bathroom, like all these things are going to affect sleep quality, which is going to affect mood. So it really is muscle contraction, like holding that pump a little bit longer things that, that you know, that people who are training for something like that need to really focus on um, but just brain function in, in, its, in itself. Like when you're, when you're, when your salt is low cramping and, and, and there's all these, you know, negative things going on with, with a brain function that, that I've gone through. I mean, I've had some terrible, terrible, experiences you know 10 years ago i remember being on the on the corner of 57th street in lexington and it was when i was training people and i literally had to hold on to like a yield sign for like 15 minutes i i couldn't move i couldn't walk because i was so depleted of all these nutrients that my body needed so you know i, I this is why i'm so passionate about this you just i've seen it from a performance standpoint i've seen it yeah. from an aesthetic standpoint i kind of live in those worlds and you can't remove things like that and I, I just want to mention one other thing. Don's totally right. And the, uh, the standard American diet has around 2,300 milligrams of sodium. That's what's recommended a day. And it, it probably is higher depending on what you're eating. But if you are moving to more whole foods, then Don is absolutely right. Depending on how much you're training, just doing something as simply as adding salt to your nutrition uh, and then seeing how you feel makes a ton of sense. Well, I mean, I haven't been doing any uh, magazine covers lately, but I will say Oh, uh, you that. should. <laughs> uh, but I will say that when I ran, because I, I do run a lot, and when I was marathoning, especially in the summer when I'm sweating a lot more, I was actually like, I set up little salt and water stations along yeah. my path, and it made the biggest difference with muscle cramping, just having, and I was same thing, Dawn, I was just like, literally had like a pink salt like the Himalayan salt shaker and it would just like down a little bit and it was huge for my performance. So I, I actually love she um Dr. G mentioned elements. I, I I love a product called Halo Hydration. That's something that I'm very, you know, I that I use probably daily and I and I love it. That's awesome. Uh Albert asked 
Uh, do taking probiotics make you angry? I think uh, no. And I would say that actually there's good data for prebiotics, you know, so prebiotics are actually what are going to feed the good bacteria. You can take a probiotic, but then the probiotic um, needs to be continued. A lot of the good research is coming out on prebiotics. I can't figure, it's funny, Dr. G, I, I can't figure out um, what I have a better response to. Like I've always taken probiotics, but then I feel like- Prebiotics, well, pre you do better pre on prebiotics. Yeah, yeah. You do I, better I, on prebiotics and, and it's, it's 100%. Recent. But is it the combination of them both, or is it just like, do it's I have probably to a combo one or the other? But would you just say, yeah. If I had to pick one for you, I would always pick a prebiotic. Pre prebiotic yeah. for you, yep. And um, yes, which I do. <laughs> and the prebiotic. reason for that, and people might be asking why, but the reason is because I'm not putting a lot of things in there that are gonna beat up the good bacteria, right? Like it's not like um, we have to build as much good. Oh no! Well, we're going to build a good bacteria with the prebiotic. Yeah, so the, the pre the prebiotic feeds the, bacteria, the bugs. Right? The yeah, prebiotic yeah. feeds the bugs, and you know, probiotics are questionable if there's a lot of good data. It, you know, but anecdotally, you see uh, people do well on it, but it just depends. However, I think prebiotics we're going to see a lot more value in that, and whether the prebiotic is a scoop of a prebiotic, uh, you know, like I use First Form's fiber formula, it has a bunch of prebiotics, or you can use anthocyanins. Don and I use a lot of makia berry or we'll use, I've um, been, you know, his next thing he doesn't know, he's going to be using something called the blue mat. Uh, yeah, blue, blue magic. magic. I've used it before. You got me turned on. I know, I know. So, I've, so these the are ways, berries amazing. <laughs> yeah. These are ways to increase, um, you know, and like red, um, red powders too are all uh, prebiotic in nature. And again, it just feeds the good bacteria. I read such a good book on gut health and like microbiome and stuff. Um, it was uh, Fiber Fueled. Have either of you guys read that? I haven't read it. Um, it was really good. I really liked it. Uh, check it out. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, are there any questions you wish your clients would ask you? I'm finding a nutritionist for myself, met with one, have an appointment. Um, wonder what I should ask them. I want the optimal nutrition for myself. What do you guys wish people would ask you? That's such a good question. What should people know? So it depends. Uh, I, I think that I'm understanding, are they asking for how to find a good- yeah, the best match for them. Well, I think there's a couple things. I think a good match is, uh, you know, this is a little more esoteric, but understanding the person's internal operating system, like what kind of individual they are and how they respond. You know, I, I've been seeing patients for 15 years. I have really good Botox. I've been seeing them for 15 years. And I will tell you that there's certain archetypes of patients and they have to, you have to jive well with your provider. For example, mm -hmm. I take care of a lot of uh, very just high-performing individuals. They don't want to necessarily talk about stuff. They're like, okay, okay tell me what I got to do. And, and I'm like, okay, so I want you to do this and you're going to execute this. And that's a good match. Right. And understanding and feeling heard, I think is really important, but really, I think understanding the archetype of who you are in relation to the provider is really important. So how, you know, like, what are the, the things that you require? And, uh, you know, I think that this person asking this question is already very conscientious. Otherwise they wouldn't have even asked the question. So you are probably going to do really well with an individual who is caring and wants to listen and um, yeah, those kinds of things. Yeah. I think that's, that's such, that is a good question. Cause like some people really like someone that's on them with some intensity. Some people yeah. like someone who's like a little bit more of a backseat and you know, it beyond their education, it's it's good personality fit because you want to talk to the person on the regular, right? You guys are both so personal, personal with your people, and that makes yeah. Sense. And I think you want to be inspired, right? So there's certain type of patient population or you know individual that wants to um, like wants to take the plan that say Don gives or I give and wants to execute well on that. Absolutely. Um, can you recommend a protein drink? Oh, sorry, Don, do you have something to add to that one? Um, yeah, I, I mean, she, she pretty much covered it. I, I mean, from a, from a coaching standpoint, it's, it's, I think there's a lot more of me than there are Dr. G's out there. So, 
Um, I, I think most people who go into a gym, they, they don't necessarily know, you know, where do I start or what do I look for? And I, I always like to say, like, are they a good trainer? Are they a good coach? Or are they both, right? Like a good trainer is someone's going to have the education and understand the biomechanics of the human body and, and understand how it works and, and have some type of a process, you know, and they're also going to include you know, a medical team around them. When I, when I own my clubs in the city, even to this date where I have my own facility out in Long Island, um, I have a medical team around me that my people have access to. So I think really this team approach is important. So that's the training end of it. The coaching end of it, I think is the harder part to teach. It's like, you know, how are they going to touch you in here? Are they going to be, you know, reaching out to you? Are they going to checking in with you or there's uh, uh, is there work going to start and stop with that one hour session because yeah. mine never did and that's why I, why I had a high level of success in this business so yeah I think and there's also going to be this period of time where like the newness may run off and I've had people now like a lot of the celebrities that work in Halloween have stuck with me for 12 years and I really appreciate their you know loyalty since you know Ryan Reynolds or Blake they've been with me for 10 12 years so that to me that's been fan fantastic and fortunately I haven't gotten old them you know the the news hasn't worn off but for some people out there they might feel like that they need to you know switch things up or maybe get in front of a new face or be motivated and i think you know that's fine also i think a, a coach someone who's going to really understand is going to want that human being that person to be in front of someone that is right for them and you know if someone ever wanted to leave me i you know is my ego going to be hurt honestly the answer is no and i think that's from being in the business for 25 years and understanding that you know at certain times you know, people need a new, you know, viewpoint. They need a new way to get motivated, even though that fortunately didn't happen to me much. But still, um, you know, I, I, I think out there, you got to make it about you. Don't make it about the coach. Love that. Can you recommend a protein drink shake, either ready, made, or fresh? What I like Thorn. I like Thorn. I, I, I like Thorn's whey protein, NSF certified, high quality um i have to dispose that I, I i do do work with thorn so um they're they're fantastic and uh, check them out and i work with a different company called first form and they um also make a great product uh i think if an individual isn't going to use a whey protein you would consider a rice pea blend mm -hmm. which i think can be very palatable for other individuals and then i'm going to say one more thing another protein shake is um so there's a company called paleo pro and they make an mm. egg white they they do kind of an animal-based um protein blend that is not whey protein i think is beneficial uh, what about what about sorry about that really really quick i want to ask dr g what about the uh the, the beef proteins are you are you big on those you let's not, talk you about not? those that's really important so the majority of beef proteins are just collagen if, um, unless they have added, it's a way in which they can kind of hide it. But typically the beef isolates are actually collagen proteins. So they're very deficient in branched chain amino acids, unless the company adds in tryptophan or um, some of the, the branch chains, which are leucine. Lucina, isolate yeah, so yeah. yep. Great question. I love, uh, this is just, you know, me, I've, I've, I've mixed thorn in with my, uh, protein sludge bowl. I make like this Ooh. disgusting concoction of deliciousness. It looks gross, but tastes really good. 56 grams of protein. Uh, but I did try a beyond vegan protein shake ones too. And if you have a sweet tooth, that one doesn't, that one tastes actually pretty good. Um, <laughs> it, it was, that's when I was weaning myself off sugar a little bit more. And I'm like, this is, it's, it's very sweet now, but, uh, yeah. it was good at the time. So I'm not sure if either of you guys want to scroll like way back up to there's there's a little bit of a long question and maybe getting the numbers in front of you will be helpful. Uh, but Lisa Ann asks, uh, she's got two questions and she gives us a bit of her background. So she's down from 190 to 140 pounds. I got it. Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. She's, uh, 51 years young um, and she wants to get to 130 pounds. I wish to focus on losing then wish to focus on building muscle with functional fitness in mind. One, Dr. G, did you recommend one gram of protein per pound of body weight? I try to keep my protein up. It's difficult without simultaneously increasing either my carb macro or fat macro. What are your thoughts? What specific proteins should I focus on? Well, number one, 51, congratulations. You've lost weight. Amazing. You, the way in which you get your protein in is very important. 
for you in particular, really 30 to 50 grams per meal, 30 on the lower end. Um, and really kind of trying to shoot for two meals where say there's 50 grams of protein in, and then you could even have a smaller snack is going to be important. And the reason I suggest that is because those two larger bolus meals will maximize muscle protein synthesis for you in particular. Um, and that's very valuable. And I'm still scrolling for the question. I will say one of the other things, let's see, what was, was the other part of that question? It was Where at 311. Okay. And if that helps. Let's see, where is 56 it? messages since then, which we will try to power through. So, um, okay, hold on. I think I found it. Okay. 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 Wait. Yes. One gram of pound for, uh, body weight. So it's actually ideal body weight. For example, if your goal is 140 pounds, which you achieved, which is incredible, then that would be your target protein goal. Uh, you try trying to keep your, uh, protein up is difficult. Um, when you do, when you prioritize protein, now protein can come from many dis different sources, whether it's a lean red meat. I use uh, lean red meat all the time because again, it is about overall caloric load. And when you choose say a higher cut, a higher fatter, fattier cut of meat, it's easier to go over your caloric need. Um, and so, yes, that would be challenging. There's a company called Certified Piedmontese that ships all over and they actually have a very lean meat. Again, this is what we eat. So it allows us to keep our calories in check. Um, uh, simultaneous, simultaneously increasing your carbs, which would make me think that maybe you're getting your car, your protein from more plant-based sources. And if you are doing that, carbohydrates will increase. Um, and yeah, so the specific proteins you should focus on are leaner proteins that they could be chicken or lean cuts of beef or even fish. Uh, eggs are great. Egg whites, throw in a couple uh, whole eggs. And then I think the second part is for Don. It is. Don, do you see that yeah. one? Yeah. Um, well, there was one question about, this is still Lisa Dan, right? Yeah. In a time crunch, could you recommend a few core full body weight movements? Yeah, but uh, I just want to, I mean, how, all right. I, I want to back up for one second, Lisa Ann. Um, she said earlier, I wish to focus on losing than wish to focus on building muscle, right? And I just want you to be careful with your words because a lot of people will come to me and say, oh, well, I want to lose and then build muscle. Like, I'm just going to do cardio, right? And the reality is, is that the more muscle we have on our body, the more of a fat burning furnace our body is going to turn into. It's like we need if we need to build muscle. That's going to be the easier way to burn fat. And I don't believe that. Yes, cardiovascular is so important. I love it. I love doing it. I love it for heart health. But is it really what allows me to stay as lean as I as, as I am? The answer is no. And I know that because there are times during the year where I'm phasing in and out of you know, um, aerobic or anaerobic training. I would just, I wouldn't neglect resistance training now totally. when you pass that comment. Just make sure that you are still getting, I'd say at least three to four days a week of resistance training in. When you say functional training, you know, everything's functional. It's, it really is. It's like a bicep curl. I mean, like, like I said this, last, I think a couple of weeks ago is, you know, when a mom's pulling a baby out of a crib, it's like, that's, that's functional. Like all this stuff is functional. We need to be strong. We need to make sure that mobility, which is the combination of flexibility and stability is you know at a high level and that we're and that we're constantly practicing that and as for core movements if you're doing the right resistance training movements our core is going to get a lot of work but if we want some specific core movements like i think getting that hard style plank and that hard style side plank really strong and what does hard style mean when someone gets into a plank position, they can hold it for five minutes like it has no interest in me. like it doesn't really show me much you need to be able to create tension in the body Right when I'm doing a, a goblet squat or a double kettlebell squat or a front squat or or a farmer carry, right? Like Frank Seppi and I today were walking around my backyard with like almost 300 pounds, you know, on our on our back doing almost like yoke carries, and my midsection was literally chattering. It was literally like, I mean, that is a that is a core movement right there. So you can get those planks strong, and I'm going to that lower hanging fruit exercises right now because a lot of us aren't doing it correctly. And there's things I love: hanging knee raises. I love ab wheel, ab wheels. Um, you know, I love like landmine, um, landmine core rotations or anti rotations. Sorry, right? Like, there's there's so much variety that I do like, but nothing is gonna nothing's gonna outweigh 
the standard basic movements that we're all doing. You know, hopefully we're doing some form of a deadlift, whether it's a trap bar, a kettlebell, a tree, like some form of a squat. That could be, you know, a one-legged squat, a split squat, you know, a front squat, you know, a goblet squat, you know, um, all these movements, RDLs, hinging, our core has to work. So get those movements strong, work on developing hypertrophy, stimulating muscle. And while we're going through these different, you know, movements, our core, it's kind of like the gateway. That's what has to stabilize our body. Because if we didn't have a core, we would just collapse, right? That's, that's going to be gone. So um, just keep mixing in resistance training is what I'm trying to tell you. Just I just wanted you to be. And I'm going to say yours. something. So I had two babies in what? In the last two and a half years. Show your abs. <laughs> and I, I walked in. I walked into Don. I was like, Don, who's got better abs? And I really uh, prioritized resistance training and, you know, I, I have been able to lose all my body weight or all my baby weight, stay pretty lean. When you say Don. Oh my God. You just know, like anyone saying that you can't get rid of loose skin is like, look at her. Like it's like her, she looks incredible. Like, you're, yeah, but I, both, I think you, you're both you're beautiful awesome. people. <laughs> no, stop, stop, stop. But she, but she prioritizes it. Like She's yeah. combining proper nutrition. She's feeding her hormones and she's going yeah. in and she's training. And listen, in the training. beginning, you and I talked about it. You weren't expecting, you know, when you're, when, when, when the little one's a month old, you're not going to be in there doing hit workouts. But that's it's right. I called happen, you. I was right? like, oh my God. Yes, that's right. But just And what did I say to you? I, I said, just move, yeah. just move. If one day it's 10 minutes, terrific. If one day you want to do, if you could do 30 minutes, great, but just yeah. the expectation, keep it low. Just guys stay consistent. That is like the one common thing that I find anyone in this industry who is really good, who has world-class, you know, a world-class physique or just world-class levels of performance. There's this level of consistency. They know how to adapt day in and day out. If they're coming in, they're not having the best day. They know how to shift gears. They're not beating themselves up. They're just trying to go and move. And that's what yeah. I think I'm most supposed to need to start thinking. Yeah, we have 10 minutes. This is so good. Um, we have so many more questions. Just so everyone knows, if you have chronometer questions, uh, one of our marketing managers, Emily, she's here. There will be, uh, we are recording this and this will be sent to everybody after. So if you have not been able to digest everything, we will definitely get it out to you. Um, and any questions people have, I'll save. And then we're always looking for content from these two. Uh, they can answer questions, not necessarily in a webinar, but on videos on our feeds as well. So next question, Jim, I take 180 to 225 grams of protein per day. He's 50 years old, Great. Uh, which is awesome. one to 1.5 grams uh, per a pound of body weight. Is that enough to overcome amino acid resistance? Plenty. So what you're talking about here is how can you improve uh, and overcome that anabolic resistance that happens in skeletal muscle? Yes. That is impressive. Awesome. That is plenty. Um, Jesse says, what is an ideal blood glucose range? Recently got a continuous glucose monitor that I'm using while tracking. Um, Jesse's 51, uh, yeah. he's 185 pounds, 5'11", and currently strength training. So the definition of diabetes is elevated blood glucose above 120 over a two hour period of time post eating. So you should be able to eat and then your blood sugar should be able to remain you know, it should be, you know, it could be anywhere from 75 to 95. It is individual. Um, and I think where this is important to understand is a continuous glucose monitor is very helpful. Don, I think we even used one for you, didn't we? And you- We, we used that Libra. Yeah, yes. we, we used that Libra we monitor. That Libra. Was, yeah. Which yeah. I, which kind of freaked me out once I was like, this is going to be in my arm for two weeks. How am I going to train? But it was guys, you don't even feel it. We, we monitored. It was pretty, it's pretty wild. And, and I think that it's interesting to get to know how your body responds to different foods. And that's really where the benefit is from using a continuous glucose monitor. Um, yeah, I, I think that that is, and, and I will say that individuals that eat or eat a higher protein diet, what I've seen clinically is their blood glucose tends to run a little bit higher, but again, nothing, their insulin levels, you know, if they're calorie controlled, their insulin levels are, you know, within optimal ranges. 
we're getting a lot of questions and just scanning through uh, just about like knowing your macro ratios in general. There's obviously a lot of questions that are coming about how much protein we should consume, but people just in, in general want to know their macro ratios. And Don, you did touch on, on um, a couple of different percentages. Just getting started, can we just reiterate what you guys would recommend people go and do getting started? Really don't know a lot about macros. Go. <laughs> well, so we, Doc, did you want to lead off with this? Uh, oh, sure. Uh, so uh, protein, you prioritize protein because number one, protein protects lean muscle mass. Protein also has this thing called the thermic effect of feeding. So what that means is the protein that you ingest, it is, it takes more energy to utilize it. And um, the recommendation I always make is one gram per pound ideal body weight. And then if you are an older individual or, you know, really looking to what Don was saying, optimize blood sugar is you can eat those protein meals in a discrete, uh, discrete amounts throughout the day, whether it's 30 to 50 grams per meal. My uh, carbohydrate recommendation, you know, you have to determine your, uh, you can use chronometer, you determine your total calorie needs. And then for carbohydrates, I think um, Don and I actually may have a slightly different view, but probably similar is that carbohydrates should be 50 grams or less per meal, probably more like 40, unless you are training because you would then get a, a more robust insulin response. So I believe that, that carbohydrates, once you determine your total carbohydrate use, that it should be 40 to 50 grams or less per meal. And then fat is whatever is left over. But you're saying that you're saying the 40, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I'm just, I, I think it has to be, it, not it has to be. I think in some cases it can be significantly higher if the person is training. If it's someone and, like you, totally. Yeah, right, right. I mean, there, like there's you really are a unicorn. I don't care what you, you say. <laughs> You're a unicorn. Yeah, but, <laughs> I, I, but I also, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'm a unicorn. I mean, I just feel like that. I've I've never I, I've never shied away from slow burning carbohydrates, and because of that, my 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 body burn. I feel like I have that that higher level of metabolic flexibility. This guy has more something. mitochondria than anyone has ever seen in the history of ever, ever. <laughs> you are a unicorn. Ever, ever. Anyway. Um, okay. There's a couple questions. Um, Dr. G, Don, I wonder if I can direct you guys to the Q and A because Kathy has a question. Um, there's a lot of information that Kathy has given us. Um, if you could just scan that. Scroll up. It's not um, down. It's, it's in the Q and A, which is a different section. Oh so yeah. I'm sorry. I'm like, going. It's yep, like I below. See it. It's like below. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Got it. Uh, basically, um, she's 54, hasn't gone through menopause yet, just missed a period for the first time. Notice that she's gaining some weight in her lower belly, mm -hmm. um, was in a car accident, had to stop lifting heavy temporarily, uh, began eating more protein, thanks to you, Dr. G, which is great. <laughs> um, is there something women have to uh, around this age have to be careful about when fasting? So she's sticking to a range of 1200 to 1600 calories a day, plus two non consecutive fasting days per week for about 36 to 40 hours. Do mm. you guys like, are we just I think that's too much? Kathy, well, first of all, amazing that you haven't gone through menopause. Menopause is just defined as missing your period for a whole year. And you are just starting on that journey. The average woman goes through menopause at 50. Uh, during that time, we do see a lot of weight gain. And one of the reasons is people are less active. Um, you know, that do they say that the hormones actually cause weight gain? The evidence doesn't necessarily support that, but the change in activity and the increase in food consumption does. Now I will say you were in a car accident, which is terrible. Which is, thank you. I was, yeah, I was just thinking it was. And that really probably, you probably limited your movement. And um, that is very impactful. And, and I will stress. say, I was just going to say, there's a certain amount of stress that actually happens, um, <coughs> you know, whether it's conscious or physiologic or both, that can really affect cortisol levels. And in addition, now putting your body through a 36 to 40 hour fast, I wouldn't do it. I would give yourself a break. I would monitor your calories, move where you can. Um, it also says that you've been keto. I would probably consider um, 
adjusting. I, I am not a huge fan of keto over the long term. I think it can be used as a tool, but it, I, I think the majority of individuals, it's not mm. sustainable. And then you lose a lot of the other things, the other nutrients, the micronutrients. So I hope That's that helps. Great. That was very helpful. Um, is Jeff- Don, do you have anything more to add? I see Don thinking. Um, Don. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I would also like the cream and the cheese and all that stuff. Like I, I'm not a believer that like all calories are created equal, right? Like I'm just, I'm from this school of, 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 of thought that, you know, calories, depending on the quality of them are going to affect our hormones. And if I'm going to sit there and eat a lot of cream and a lot of cheese, it's just going to affect me negatively. And I, and it's just, I, I've just never been a believer that like a hundred calories from X is the same as a hundred calories from Y. Like our bodies are just going to process it differently. And, um, you know, I, I just, so really focus on the one thing that Dr. G and I really, um, I, all the things we have in common, the thing that we're on the same page with is food quality. Like our, our lunch this weekend was, so you know, good. it was a, a protein. It was a protein. She went with no carbs. I went with sweet potatoes and we had like an array of vegetables and it was just, you know, very nutrient dense, very, you know, fibrous, very, you know, mi micro and macronutrients. I mean, we, we hit those numbers that we need and just try and avoid sometimes when we start adding a lot of that fluff in, um, it could get very filling, right? You're eating cheese, you're eating cream. It's high in fat. It's going to get really filling. And then it's going to keep you from really being able to consume those other nutrients that our body needs, either macro or micro. Like, and I, and I hear this all the time with people trying to put on some muscle. They're like, you know, I eat a lot. Like I eat everything. I'm like, no, you don't. Like how much you really eat? And they're like, oh my God, you should see my breakfast. It was huge. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe how big it was. And I look at it on paper. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't eat for five, six hours. Like, yeah, when I was full. And I'm like, yeah, but that's like, that's when we have to get, like, get a little bit better with the timing. So just be careful with what you're putting in your body. Like not all calories are created equal. Yeah. And chronometer with our micronutrient data <laughs> <laughs> can definitely point that out. Uh, we are wrapping up on time. Uh, there was just one more question that I saw that was asked twice. So um, is gelatin the same as collagen? No. So gelatin, so collagen, just from a practical standpoint, the amino acid profile is slightly different. Both is incomplete and collagen is dissolvable in water, whereas gelatin is something you would typically heat up and then it would solidify. Mm. But could you use them interchangeably? I'd have to look at the, um, the amino acid profile. I think that they're probably both beneficial, but, um, you know, collagen probably is more robust in the amounts of amino acids. But again, I'd have to look at that, but they're not, they are not the same, uh, but close. That is great. I think we got through most of them. You guys are rock stars, Emily. Uh, I've seen you on the side there. Thanks, Emily. She's been absolutely killing out the chronometer questions. That was so good. Uh, we'll be doing this again next month, right? Like we right. have to keep this, this, this train rolling. So um, yeah, we'll definitely so fun. be Anyone who wants to watch this again, or if your question was answered and you want to go back, I will be sending this out via email to everybody within the next couple of days. Awesome. Thanks for having us. You guys yeah, are so Thanks great. so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone.